This conference will now be recorded. And would you go ahead and read the uh, standard uh, disclaimer for COVID? Yes. Due to the nature of the declaration of a state of emergency due to novel coronavirus COVID-19, pursuant to code section 2.2-3708.2, this meeting is to be held by electronic communications via the web platform GoToMeeting. The catastrophic nature of this declared emergency makes it impractical and unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. And the purpose of this meeting is to discuss or transact the business statutorily required or necessary to continue operations of the public body. Order. And if you'll do roll call. I can do roll yep. call for you. Okay. Um, uh, please put your uh, mics on unmute so you're ready when I call your name. And I will start with the city of Fredericksburg. I do have that uh, Chair McLaughlin, uh, McLaughlin is here. Um, is Mr. Josh, Joshua Brock present? I'm here. Thank you. Mr. John Castellaran? Here. Mr. Matthew Rowe. Here. Right. For Spotsylvania County, Vice Chair Al Alfred Durante. Here. Thank you. Mr. Neil Holleran. Neil's here on the phone. I'll log into the meeting in a minute. Okay. Mr. Stan Huey. Mr. Josh Templeton. Mr. Anton Stubbs. Here. Thank you. For Stafford County, Mr. Melvin Allen Sr. Mr. David Swan. Ms. Ethelian Crenshaw. Mr. Glenn Goldsmith. Mr. Wade Sudrath. Here. Thank you. For Caroline County, Mr. Ken Pogue. Mr. Michael Hoyt. Mr. Justin Chenault. For King George County, Dr. Robert Gates. Here. Thank you. And at large members, Mr. Larry Gross. Here. Mr. Rupert Farley. Mr. Dustin Savage. That is all for roll call. You may now put your mics back on mute. Thank you. Okay, we, uh, we I heard from Dave Swan earlier, so we must have lost him temporarily. We'll be looking for him to join us again. I will take note, thank you. All right, item three is uh, the agenda, and I wanna make an amendment to the agenda before uh, for you to consider. Um, at the, the TAC, meeting on uh, October 5th, I think it was, whatever it was, that Monday a week ago. Um, they talked about an item called new regional study ideas and uh, and proposal or study ideas and proposals. So I think we should hear that because representing citizens, we might have some ideas what's a what's a good study. And so I want to add that in. So I'm proposing that we approve the agenda as amended to add a new 7E, 7 echo, 7.E, 7 e for new regional study ideas and proposals, uh, which Adam will present. And then the subsequent F and G will be renumbered, or E and G, will, E and F will be renumbered and moved down behind it. So is anybody willing to uh, make a motion to approve that? No one. A motion to approve the agenda. That's all I'm looking for. <laughs> As amended. Hey, Dave. Dave Swan, can you hear me? Yes, you're loud and clear now. Okay, uh, I'll make a motion uh, for what you said. Thank Second. You. And, and Al will probably 
second it, right, Al? I think he did. He raised his hand. Okay. He raised second. his hand in second. Uh, is there anything to change to the agenda or this agenda as amended? Hearing none, then we'll, uh, we will establish that the agenda is approved as amended. All right. Now we have to approve the uh, CTAC meeting minutes. And before we look for a motion, is there any discussion that anybody has from reviewing the meeting minutes that requires an amendment of any sort from last week? Okay, I will look for a, a, a motion to approve the meeting minutes from Wednesday, September 16th. Nobody wants to talk? Nobody wants to approve it? Need a motion to Dave, approve the, the CTAC. Dave Who is one makes a motion to approve the minutes from the last CTEC meeting Thanks. in September. Second. Excellent. OK. Uh, I'll ask, is there anyone who wants to abstain from this item because you perhaps did not attend the meeting and were unable to review it uh, by looking at the video? Is there any abstentions? OK. Is there anybody? Opposed to approving the CTAC meeting minutes from September uh, 16th. Anybody opposed? Okay, hearing none, then uh, the, the uh, meeting minutes from September 16th are approved. And now Stacy will lead us on a review of the uh, item five, the policy committee meeting. I was on mute. Um, so many things, um, just to summarize, um, that happened at the policy committee meeting um, that was on September 21st. Um, I'll go ahead and go through these and if you wanna jot your questions down and you can ask them at the end, that would be great. Um, so there was a presentation by the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation um, and the presenter gave information on transit funds and how they pertain to George Washington Regional Commission as well as FAMPO. It was just to gain a sense of, you know, what transit funds are out there and how, how could we make use of them. Um, also at the meeting, the committee endorsed a draft memorandum of understanding, um, and it is going to be sent to the Transportation Planning Board, um, the Northern Tra um, Transportation Planning Board in DC for their consideration. This agreement outlines FAMPO's duties for portions of North Stafford that are part of the TPB's jurisdiction. Um, and Federal Highway requires that FAMPO and TPB have an updated MOU. So the draft um, has been endorsed by the policy committee and now it's been sent to the TPB. Another item, um, Mr. Tim McLaughlin, the Spotsylvania Policy Committee member, he began a discussion on GW Ride Connect. Um, GW Ride Connect is not considered to be part of FAMPO, but they have a role in transportation management. So that's why they were a topic of discussion. Um, they help workers connect with commuting services, such as van pools. Mr. McLaughlin um, asked that the policy committee consider how GW Ride Connect fits into the larger regional transportation planning world. Um, and recently, it was concluded that GW Ride Connect is a customer service organization rather than a planning organization. Um, at that point in the meeting, um, Chairwoman Shelton um, asked that the discussion be tabled until more information can be provided from GW Ride Connect. Moving on, on the topic of future funding, um, the Transportation Advisory Committee, TAC, uh, chairman gave an update on the work that TAC is doing to produce a project prioritization methodology. Um, and this will help evaluate which transportation projects should be funded 
with CMAC and STBG funds. These are certain federal funds. Um, and the group has formed a working group which will provide a draft of recommended scoring processes and that will be released later this year. The committee also approved Spotsylvania's funding request to fully fund their Route 1 and Market Street project. Um, the reason for the request for funding was because costs have increased, so additional funds were needed. There was also a discussion on holding a call for projects to be funded with CMAC and STBG federal funds. Um, a motion on this item passed to defer the call for projects until a funding discussion takes place on other available funding at a later time, namely 5307 funds. Staff also gave an update at the meeting on work that's planned for the development of the 2050 LRTP, and CTAC will um, hear this information tonight at the committee meeting. Staff also gave an update on smart scale round four project applications. Um, and that update briefly is that applications have been submitted and staff are now following up on comments and questions from BDOT related to those project applications. Still on the topic of smart scale, the policy committee voted to endorse three smart scale projects that have been submitted for consideration, um, but those three projects had not yet been included in FAMPO's constrained project list, fiscally constrained project list of our long range plan. So to show project support, since they're not included in our plan yet, um, the policy committee endorsed these projects just to strengthen those applications in the smart uh, scale process. Staff also gave an update to the policy committee um, on the transportation improvement plan, the TIP, and CTAC will also receive an update at tonight's meeting on that. Staff gave an annual report on the work that they have completed. This report is available on the FAMPO website and um, it included public involvement achievements, the completion of the transportation improvement program, the TIP, um, smart scale round four project submission completions, and the Lafayette Boulevard transit study, um, which included recommendations to improve access of Fred bus service along the Lafayette Boulevard corridor. Lastly, a discussion occurred at the meeting um, around a variety of proposed bylaw changes for the policy committee. The discussion ended after VDOT stated that before any bylaw changes could be um, adopted, the UPWP, the yearly staff work plan, um, must first had to be um, first has to be amended to include that specific provision that we can work on bylaw changes. Um, the exception being that we can update bylaws with provisions on remote meeting participation. Are there any questions at all on that? Again, that was uh, what occurred at the last policy committee meeting, the decision making body of FAMPO. This is Larry. I had one if you can answer it. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the, uh, the smart scale projects had to be um, I guess endorsed by uh, the policy committee uh, to be in the constrained plan is is that is that a requirement for smart scale projects that come from FAMPO? Um, I will let Adam chime in here or Matthew. Um, I believe they have to be, and we're working on that. Um, Adam, are you on the line? Do you want to weigh in? I am, Stacy. Thanks. So, Larry, to your question, the Smart scale is a little vague on this. They ask in the technical guidance that projects are consistent with the LRTP. Um, you have the LRTP, the long range plan as a whole, and then part of that plan is the constrained project list, which has the fiscal constraint determination therein. Um, sometimes smart scale projects are funded through the smart scale process and then added to the LRTP, which is sort of what we're at uh, the, the the position we're in with these three projects in particular that we put before the policy committee. Um, 
but the the general rule of thumb is that yes projects that we put forward for smart scale should be within the LRTT so um, I hope that's a sufficient response to your question Larry no, it's good I, I I understand it's a little bit of a chicken and egg nowadays I think between the, the the requirements for the CLRP and the requirements for smart scale I appreciate the answer sure thing And Mr. Chairman, I believe it's back over to you. If we still have you, I think your camera disappeared. Yeah, I, sh I should. I should be back. I uh, lost you for a while from the basement. I'm in the, I was in one of the cellars, so um, <laughs> now I seem okay. to have better signal. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, we are on item six: initial public comment. And at this time, we have not received any uh, written comments from members of the public, but I do ask that you check to see if we have anyone on the line. Um, but also up on your screen for members of the public who are in attendance, we would um, ask that you complete a post-meeting survey. You'll be asked to provide contact information, demographic information, and feedback on your meeting experience. You can use the survey link provided on your screen, or you can scan the QR code that you see on your screen with your smartphone. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. It helps us um, track who we're reaching, who we're not, and allows us to improve the uh, meeting experience for you. And Mr. Chairman, to you to check if there's anyone on the line to provide comment. Okay, thank you for uh, adding that uh, post meeting survey. That's a, that was a great initiative on your part. Okay, anyone uh, who is uh, from the members of the public who would like to make comments or questions uh, are welcome to do so at this time. We will also have an additional time for public comment allot allotted after the member discussion, so which is the very tail end of of this meeting. So probably an hour and a half from now. So. But is there anyone online now who would like to address this body? Anyone? Okay, there'll be another opportunity at the end. Um, so hearing none, I'll close the uh, public comment and move to item number seven. So we are... Uh, Fortunate today on item 7A is to have uh, Eric Nelson with us, who is the principal city transportation planner for obviously the city of Fredericksburg. Um, and uh, he's going to give us the perspective um, from Fredericksburg as a regional central point um, uh, and commercial center. So, Eric, thank you for, uh, for doing that tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm clear. Very, very good. Uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, go through. Uh, I'll I'll go through sort of the basics of of what we do, and uh, I'm pretty freewheeling about this. So if anybody wants to interrupt with a question, please feel free to do so. Uh, that, that won't bother me at all. So I'm gonna just uh, just jump in, and again, please interrupt if you have something that you wanna wanna ask. Uh, Fredericksburg is a, only 10 square miles, so when we compare ourselves with the county, we're, we're fairly compact, which uh, has certain advantages transportation-wise, but we have literally everything. We have uh, interstate, railway, state routes, uh, neighborhood streets, a downtown grid, sidewalks, trails, bridges, um, so we, 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 we literally have everything, um, except we don't have an airport. Ha. Um, the interstates, um, they, that's, a, it's, it's about 3.3 miles through the city and the work that's going on right now is, is tremendously, uh, significant in that we're going to see a slug of development in this region that's going to be comparable to what occurred after Route 1 was built, uh, after I-95 was built, we're, we're going to see a, a tremendous, uh, uh, period of growth. So uh, really the planners need to be ready for that. Um, the railway also is getting a lot of substantial investment. Uh, you've heard of the high-speed rail 
the bottleneck on the East Coast is the Long Ridge across the Potomac River up in Washington, D.C., and that project is uh, is, is funded and, and underway. Uh, and again, that uh, rail capacity is going to have a tremendous impact on this region. Um, we have state routes and collectors, um, and we're, we're having we're seeing some some again a lot of investment uh, on those routes. Uh, we're we're, we're going to see uh, TDM improvements on Route Three. Uh, we have smart scale projects for Route One. Uh, Fall Hill Avenue was completed a few years ago. Uh, four lane divided road. And at this point, Lafayette Boulevard is really the only remaining uh, uh, state route uh, e extending through the city that needs any, that, that has not been uh, improved. And that, that is currently uh, being studied uh, to see how much, to see really what the configuration of the road can be. Um, we, it's standard would be a four lane, divide, four lane divided road with sidewalks and, and, and perhaps a trail. Uh, if we were to do that, we would probably take out about 50 houses within the city. So the right-of-way cost would be prohibitive. Uh, that's really not gonna be realistic. So uh, VDOT is studying or is going to resume a study of the potential configuration. Perhaps we can, we can use, um, we can get by with three lanes. Uh, the idea is to uh, in, introduce roundabouts so that we remove the left turn movement so that anybody coming up to Lafayette Boulevard would be able to turn right. And then if they were going the, the other direction, they would find a, a roundabout fairly quickly and be able to turn around and head back in the other direction. So we, we're thinking tricks like that might help us to uh, uh, more effectively get that road improved uh, without, again, taking out 50 houses, which would be insane. Um, we those primary routes through the city, we, we have bypasses, of course, uh, the Route 3, uh, Blue and Great Parkway, uh, Jeff Davis Highway. The, the business uh, routes through town, we are actually um, slowing down the traffic. Uh, back in the 60s, the uh, highway, uh, the uh, road planners introduced uh, one-way pairs uh, through the downtown and in other locations, um, again, to move traffic. Uh, the concept now is uh, to reduce the speed, and so we're looking at the potential for removing the one-way pairs and, and reintroducing two-way traffic. It won't work everywhere. Uh, Caroline Street downtown, for example, uh, probably would have to remain one way because we have freight issues. Uh, there's, there's no loading zone, so uh, deliveries occur when a truck literally just stops in the middle of the street and start to unload so we have to have that we have to have that second lane so traffic can move it's very good at traffic calming uh but and again that those th those kind of constraints are are there for us um you might have seen uh changes like uh on william street william street is already two-way but we uh, had a paving project and introduced a substantial amount of parking up near uh near St. Mary's Church, and so there is the traffic has slowed tremendously uh, because we've reduced the, we've taken out a travel lane. Uh, and again, uh, the intent is to slow the traffic rather than uh, uh, follow through on the, uh, the, the earlier concept of, of moving it through quickly. Um, speaking of downtown, the downtown grid has worked very well for us from a uh, from a congestion standpoint, the grid uh, diffuses traffic tremendously. Uh, and back in the day, it, it drove the uh, it, it drove the uh, modelers nuts because the, uh, the model really couldn't account for for that. Uh, certainly, it can now. But uh, the, the grid really is a very functional uh, very functional uh, pattern, and and we've we've reused it in other places, and really should be doing more. Um, we have a lot of because of the city is is compact we've had a pretty strong program for uh, bicycle pedestrian access we have uh, close to 10 miles of uh, multi-use path we have about 120 miles of sidewalks um, but that's not enough there certainly is a uh, is need for more um, 
and so we we are paying a lot of attention to making connections, uh, connecting neighborhoods to existing facilities, uh, connecting connecting anything that, that that we can really, and that's really uh, taking up our uh, a lot of our effort. Um, so the, yeah, connections are a big thing. And then uh, adding uh, adding amenities in the downtown, such as bicycle racks, et cetera. So that's uh, that, that again uh, takes up a lot of a uh, lot of effort. Um, you're coordinating that with uh, you know trees, opening of car doors, et cetera, et cetera. So you try to provide the amenity without creating uh, a problem for somebody else. Uh, and then we have uh, we have a lot of bridges. We have interstate bridges probably uh well probably four at this point uh or at least will be four uh, we have 22 local bridges we have nine bicycle and pedestrian bridges and, and those have issues uh sort of all all their own so we have a we have a pretty substantial amount of of uh of infrastructure um the uh Again, the concentration allows us to be pretty flexible and and provide a lot of uh, a lot of choice, which is really the the intent. But even with all that, there's there's a long way to go, and so we uh, we are, are are pressing on with that. Uh, happy to answer questions. I've been involved with FAMPO since uh, FAMPO was invented back in I think it was 1993. <laughs> that's that's a little scary. Um, but happy to answer any questions, uh, pointed questions, uh, and, and, and anything else. Well, maybe, uh, maybe you could comment on, and you sort of touched on it, but uh, we have talked about in this meet, or this body, for example, when you mentioned the bike paths and the, tra and the trails that we have, especially the bike, um, you know the counties around are saying you've got these great trails and everything but we don't we can't get to them we need to hook up to you so i mean i guess i'm really talking about the those uh places where and, and roadways as well like route 217 coming into fredericks we got you know lanes going out and then they get down to one they neck down to just one uh two lane traffic that sort of thing so both both uh those connections for bikes and uh roadways yeah, we we've and and again, FAMPO has been uh, has been coordinating a lot of uh, coordinating a lot of this. We we uh, the East Coast Greenway uh, we've uh, coordinated with with Spotsylvania. The East Coast Greenway will come across the Chatham Bridge when that bridge is uh, reopened. It'll have a ten foot wide bike ped uh, facility on the downstream side, separated by a barrier. Uh, we you know, getting the East Coast Greenway into into town, we are playing around with different routes, but it will eventually go out Route 2 and 17 uh, to the east, uh, and that's where it will tie in with uh, Spotsylvania County. Um, the and, and again, we're looking at the 10-foot wide facility on the uh, on the north side of the road, um, and that's that's the Tidewater Trail. And and uh, Jacob Passwick has been very aggressive in, in getting the route uh, identified through Spotsylvania. So that, that connection is, I believe, well in hand. It, it's going to take a few years, but that's that's well planned. Um, we are looking at other going. We, we have a, a trail along an old the old Virginia Central Railway that goes uh, along out the uh, to the west uh, along the southern edge of the city. Um, we have a a, we have funding in place to construct a bridge from the end of the trail where it uh, terminates at the Idlewild neighborhood to go across Hazel Run, and that would uh, take take us into Spotsylvania County. And uh, the immediate connection would be with the Kingswood uh, uh, neighborhood subdivision. And then we have put in our plans uh, a tunnel underneath I-95. Um, that's an expensive project. Uh, we would have to get all kinds of approvals, but it's not an impossible project. And that would continue the Virginia Central Railway again into Spotsylvania County. And depending on what Spotsylvania County does with that route, uh, conceivably it could end up one of these days out at Orange, which was the terminus of the uh, 
of the railway. So uh, we're, we're we're happy to talk connections, uh, and we we're actively pursuing some. So uh, again, I think uh, FAMPO deserves credit for keeping those, that uh, that regional coordination alive. Eric uh, David Swan of Stafford County. I have a question. Sure. Yeah, uh, just a, a simple question. Are you doing anything to enhance, let's say, bike transportation or pedestrian transportation to the new baseball stadium? Uh, from, yes. From the city. Right, right. Uh, the there is alongside Paul Hill Avenue when it was reconstructed. We we have a a ten foot wide multi use path uh, going uh, up the hill. Uh, uh, on along Fall Hill Avenue, and there is or will be uh, pedestrian links to the the baseball area. Um, okay. That, yeah, I'm familiar with that path. That's a nice addition. Right. Uh, the connections we don't have we we don't have a project that we're uh, that that the city is is sponsoring or undertaking. But as the development occurs in there, we're asking that those sidewalks and trails be uh, implemented. So the planners are. Uh, doing that it, it it's it comes across as a little bit piecemeal but again you know when you when you fill in all the gaps then then eventually you get there there might be a, a reason for us to get involved to to do some kind of overall um provide some overall cohesiveness but uh yes that 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 we see that as, as an important route now oh, that's good and while i'm thinking of it uh you know that would be uh, a passageway both ways if you were at a ball game and let's say there was a double header and a, a time frame in between, then uh, out of towners could uh, take a stroll and end up in the city, you know, which would be a good oh, thing, yeah. I think. Yeah, good, good point, good point. Uh, the the hill brings up an interesting uh, uh, point. We've uh, we're wrestling with the issue of uh, of uh, uh, as pedal assisted bicycles, e bikes. Um, you know the, the Fredericksburg is is characterized by by these hills, so a lot of these trails are going to be going uphill, which is a, a killer for the average person, and certainly for somebody of my yeah. age. Uh, but e-bikes seem to uh, to really be uh, they, you know they they don't make a lot they don't make any noise, and they they allow that, uh, that they they just make it more more uh, convenient to actually use those trails without having to be a an Olympic athlete. Yeah, and I see another thing is a new sign going up, electronic sign on I-95. Is the city in any way involved in uh, in that signage and utilization to highlight the city's historical value and all that? Oh, right. Yeah, you're talking about the uh, for the baseball sign. Right. Yeah, the, uh, we've been yeah. intimately involved with in that. So, yeah, that, that's going to turn out to be a really good partnership to uh, put all kinds of stuff up there. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Your roundabouts are uh, challenging at times, but uh, <laughs> seem to keep the flow going. <laughs> they, they do. And we've got we've got more coming. It's, it's the darndest thing. I saw that in your plan. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions for Eric? Um, Eric, before you go, this is Stacy from FAMPO. Could you uh, just take a minute and let folks know if they want to find out more information about Fredericksburg's transportation, what's the best way that they can find more information, whether it that be at a public meeting or looking on your website or reaching out to a specific person? Yeah, I, I'm I'm a one man uh, one man circus up here. So uh, contacting me is is the easiest. Uh, I am on the website uh, under the transportation division. Uh, I think we have our trails plan posted there, uh, and certainly my number is there and email and stuff. So I'm I'm happy to uh, to talk uh, with with anybody about anything and and share. Uh, whatever we have. Uh, in fact, I would welcome it. So uh, please, uh, if, if you're at, at, in the least bit inclined, uh, give me a holler. Thank you. 
Okay, I'll I'll say for uh, for our uh, the body the uh, members of CTAC, uh, you know Eric was the chairman and now he's a, you know still still is the not the chairman but is the representative for Fredericksburg, but on the uh, technical uh, advisory committee. So many times the PC the policy committee will just say, well let's kick this down to the to technical guys because they're the real expert planners and get the input from them and get the draft that then goes up through. PC. So I try as much as possible um, as the chairman of this group. I'm not a member of the tactical, of the technical advisory committee, but I do try to uh, participate in or, or listen to the meetings um, and uh, and or watch them now that they're recorded and watch them. Uh, and it helps me actually prepare for uh, for our meetings. Um, so there's often a very good uh, technical, very collegial group. Uh, it's a very technical discussions that go on. So. Um, so I recommend commend that to anyone. So, and uh, want to thank Eric for being with us today and uh, giving us those great insights. I mean, everything goes through Fredericksburg, you know. It seems like so. <laughs> yeah, Fredericksburg, where all roads lead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is Larry Grunts. I just, I just want to thank Eric for coming and talking. My, my pleasure, Larry. That was a. Initiative of of Stacy to get the get us more uh, input for directly from the the planners in the community and increase our awareness and, and knowledge. So thank you, and and much appreciated that she's doing that. Yep. <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll move to uh, item seven B, which is uh, Jordan. Uh, Miss Chandler is going to give us uh, updates on the transportation improvement program. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention to you that item uh, II, equity analysis methodology, really seems to me to fall into the uh, Citizens Transportation Advisory Committee wheelhouse, because it talks about different uh, characteristics of, of the citizenry It's going to be using these our transportation, using transportation in the region. And are, are we uh properly allowing for that and uh, so i think uh, really pay attention to uh that it's kind of in, a, in, in an infancy talking about methodologies and some potential methodology but uh, we should be uh i think we should really take that aspect of this to heart so without further ado jordan thank you mr chair so i just wanted to start with the fy 21 24 tip Im implementation so in September, Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration approved the 21-24 TIP, and it was implemented on October 1st. So the state will conduct three STIP TIP rollovers. So that's transitioning from the 2018-21 TIP to the 21-24 TIP. And FAMPO, they're included in the third amendment, and that will probably be at the end of this year or maybe the beginning of next year. And with this comes a couple of modifications based on the state's performance measures that we'll have to include into our TIP um, as we roll it over. Um, so I'll move on to then the equity analysis methodology. And so this is just to talk about the transportation improvement program or the TIP, um, the methodology for the equity analysis. So the TIP is a four year fiscally constrained list of regionally significant projects and any projects in the region that have federal funding. And this comes directly from the LRTP. And so Title VI is based on two executive orders, um, one for environmental justice, which can, um, includes low income and minority populations, and the other for limited English proficiency populations. Um, and it just reinforces the basic and legal rights um, that are contained in the Civil Rights Act. And this is mainly just the fair and equal treatment um, um, of those peoples. Um, so the importance of this methodology is because we want to analyze how our transportation projects that we plan benefit <clears throat> or burden these dis um, these minority populations and just per, um, and we want to make sure that they don't have disproportionately higher <clears throat> adverse effects on these populations. So we have to figure out what might be the most appropriate determination method. 
So the first method that we looked at was from the Richmond Regional TPO from their 2045 long range transportation plan. And what they did was they calculated the average for each target population and then looked at that average for the region and said any census tracts mm -hmm. that are above that average are identified as a concentration area of protected populations. And so if we scroll to the next slide, we see the first example for low income population in our region. And so all these tracks are just right above the regional average. And then again, on the next slide, we look at the limited English proficiency, just to give two examples. And so the pros of this methodology on the next slide are that it um, is very conservative and uses a lot of census tracts um, and is more on the cautious side of what we include in the environment um, in the equity analysis. But the con is it doesn't get a very um, concentrated um, population. And so as we move on to the next methodology, this is from VDOT, um, the Title VI manual, and we got an updated version of this. So um, we have no longer from 2000, so we have an updated mm -hmm. version. Um, and what this was, it was also looking at the regional average, but then identifying something that might be meaningfully greater. So meaningfully greater um, might be that it's twice the regional average. So if a census tract is 10%, but the regional average is only 5%, that is uh, probably significant. Whereas if the census tract is only 75% of the population and then the regional average is 70, that's only a 5% difference. So it might not be as uh, um, important. And so here's the regional threshold that we use. So we use the average for each population and then just simply multiply that by two. And then again, we have the low income example, which is just doubling the regional average. And then again, the limited English proficiency example. And so the pros and cons. So this highlights a smaller number of census tracts that have the higher concentration of protected populations. But the con of this is it has the potential to leave out census tracts if the highest value is less than the doubled average. So if the doubled average is 10, and the only highest census tract you have is 9%, then nothing will be highlighted in the map. And then the third methodology is from the Roanoke Valley trans, um, TPO from their 2045 long range transportation plan. And they created an environmental justice index. And what they did was calculated the regional average for each target population. And then they used the standard deviation. And so anything within 0.25 standard deviations from the mean was given a score of zero. And anything with an additional 0.25 um, is added to one point up to max of 10 points. And lastly, to, to create the index part of that, they um, summed the target populations into one final image. So as we scroll down, this is the standard deviation for the limited income population. And as the colors on the map get darker, that means that there's a higher concentration. And then again, for the limited English proficiency. And so the pro, or, so here's the, um, the index, which is pretty much just the low income population all added with the limited English population target to create an index. So the darker, means that there's a high concentration of both populations. And so the pros of this is you can easily compare target populations to each other. And it's a more comprehensive approach and takes a look at um, many population types when it is combining the sum into that index. But the con is that is the number of census tracts in our region, which is only 63, a large enough sample size to have a meaningful use of standard deviation. And so the next slide has some sources for you where this information was from. And then the last slide is that we're just seeking your feedback on which methodology to utilize and which one is most fitting for our tip. 
And then lastly, um, once we select the methodology, we want to figure out what is a crucial factor in determining whether these programmed improvements will have disproportionately high or adverse effects on the protected populations. So an example for this is that project location does not always say whether it's an inherent benefit or harm to a location. And then for example, the Richmond Long Range Transportation Plan, they looked at per capita spending. So they looked at the forecast funding and calculated the total funding for all of the projects in the area um, by the number of people in the area. And they did it for the disadvantaged populations as well as the non-disadvantaged populations. And then so I can take any comments that you guys have on which methodology you think is most fitting or any feedback that you guys have. Well, this is this is why I thought this was important because it gets to us representing all of the citizens uh, in our communities. So whether they're low income, over 65, under five years old, English is second language and all that, we have to be sensitive to that um, uh, when it's uh, when it's large numbers and significant and, and just to determine if these projects have an adverse effect. And so this will be some methodology um, once methodology is selected. So we get to put input the TAC was the TAC is looking at this exact same thing. They had this exact same briefing, um, and then the PC, the policy committee, actually will obviously will determine what the methodology is. But uh, we, as this body, should be able to put inputs to this and think about this methodology and what we like about some, or come up with another methodology which might be wonderful too. So, and then after the methodology is selected, then we're when we're doing planning efforts for any project, it would be taking these into account and say oh here's an area that has a you know has a high uh, a high number of english as second language what does this project do to adversely affect them or act, or can we do something to make it so it's even more helpful uh, uh, to that particular community for example so i think this is uh, important for as we move forward hey, mr chairman this is melvin allen yeah go ahead yeah i i I, uh, I was looking at it. I, I, I'm looking at the the, uh, model, the method three, and I looked at it because it's looking like all the rest of them, I'm not saying this to be negative, you know, it, yeah, it has some race base, but it looked like this one, the Rona one, is more simple and not as complex. And, and I think it creates an understanding that this, this, uh, this method here will create not just race base, but just as the uh, the the needs for the, for for our area, and not just race base or this other um, age group. It didn't mention anything like that. It just spoke on the perspective. It looked like uh, uh, what 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 is it a benefit of all or race base or age group? So I I, I think that Rono one, in, in my opinion, it, it, that's the one I I I looked at. Thank you. Jordan, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think that is true that this method, you can analyze more than just one population at a time. Um, and again, we're going to use whatever methodology to determine the census tracts and then again, overlay the project so that we can have a better view of what populations or which regions are going to have the most, um, um, which regions have the most, not the most transportation projects, but which have a proportions of transportation projects that could potentially benefit the region. This is John Castellaren from Fredericksburg. Uh, that, that idea of overlay that you just mentioned, is that, are you, are you meaning the other two will be able to do what Roanoke, the Roanoke idea does where multiple measures are being included to create one specific kind of index so we can see how different elements, different tracks here play together in certain areas or is it just this one is the only one that that does that in a definitive way so this method is the only one that overlays target populations on top of each other looking at a limited english population and then also for example in this one the limited income population um, the other ones just mainly look at the regional average in individual um, census 
but they will all be overlaid with the proposed transportation improvements in the region. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, this is Larry. Oh, um, this is Larry Gross. Um, so this is used on like the back end of a process to determine if there is disadvantages. Would you use this on the front end to rate projects or to make it part of a criteria for priority? Um, so this isn't going to be used in any sort of rating methods. Um, this mainly just looks at what the region is planning and how it affects the um, the community. And then, then when each project goes into an individual project by project scope, there will be a full analysis done for each individual project, and that's done by VDOT or whoever is um, in charge of the specific project. So we're looking at a very regional level. Okay, no, thanks. So this is Al, I'm sorry. Um, so will, mm -hmm. would, would that in essence um, have a possible effect on future funding projects, like from the federal government? If pers let's say a project is completed and it, you know, the, the EJ part of it is, is missing uh, or, you know, has a negative effect on you know, population of, of uh, you know, whichever population you want to look at, would that keep future projects from being funded? Possible. I'm not exactly sure. I know this is just to get a more comprehensive look at what populations are in our region and where our projects are proposed to be um, implemented. Um, so I'm not exactly, I don't think that this would affect negatively any other projects proposed um but i don't know if adam has any comment on that but i i don't think it would sure i can i can chime in just a second um maybe al to to respond to that question so um stacy might know but th to my knowledge there is no language in the federal code around um projects not receiving funding because they have an adverse effect on a protected population type. However, it is a requirement for any federal funding um, to be on a project that it's at least considered. So that's part of the impetus for doing this type of analysis. And, and we're kind of at the stage now, as far as what Jordan presented, where we're looking at getting buy-in on the methodology that we use to say what is a, a tract, like what's the threshold going to be, essentially. Um, and then I, I see here too that Brandon talked about on a, on a project level in the chat here that um, NEPA, so if there's a project that meets certain criteria and it's a large enough project in scale, it has to go through the NEPA review process. And in that, um, these types of issues are also considered. Um, so hopefully that provides a little bit of context for your question, Al. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I asked um, in my experience in working not so much with this committee, but certainly with the the with other committees, I won't name <laughs> um, transportation base, is that it might be that a process is chosen that would have a better look if it had implication rather than a more accurate look. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm being my it, usual. It does. I'm being my usual pessimistic self, basically. So. <laughs> well, I, I would like to think we, this committee, would use this as a tool when we're talking about projects and they come up for discussion and you know benefits and everything, and and someone says. Wait a minute. What about that area? Is that in that a, an area where there's a you know a large number of people that are over 65 or whatever? What, how does it impact that? We could um, we could use that as part of our recommendation process. Hey, this is uh, Neil Holler and Wisconsin. Listen, the only thing I'm thinking of is how much do we really care where these people are versus what they actually use to get around on the roads or you know via the rail and stuff? Is there data or metadata behind? given the fact that, granted, they might not speak a lot of English or they're over 65, but, you know, they drive cars or they use 
Fredericksburg's bus service or whatever it is? Is there stuff behind the, the data behind that at all? Are we collecting that? Um, I don't, there is, I'm not exactly sure which data is behind that, but this is just looking at the census demographic data. Um, one of the categories that we are looking at is if they have a car or not. Um, so zero car households, that's a population type that we're looking at, um, but we haven't looked at anything with the VRE or FRED. Anecdotally, I mean, the only, the only, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you, you finish your thought. I mean, the only thing I'm thinking is that environmental justice wise is, you know, if you put a big giant roadway up through some population area and they're over 65, then you've got cars and pollution and all that stuff. I kind of get that. But I mean, it, you know, that's it's a whole other load of variables you got to think about when you're talking about, you know, is it more beneficial to put this road here so people like this can get around or have access to get around versus, you know, the air pollution it might cause, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I kind of get where that data is going, but honestly, you know, if we're not thinking about what it is they use to get around and don't have that data, I kind of don't care where they're at other than the fact that it seems like methodology three tells you fairly comprehensively across all the categories that, okay, here's where they all are. And, then the next question you have to ask is, if we're gonna do a project like something here or through this area, do we need to consider something else on top of the fact, I don't know, like street signs in Spanish or something like that um, in this case, because of where it is and where these people are. But at the same time, if they're not gonna be on the road because they're not driving because they all walk or and granted, they don't all walk. It's not an all or nothing thing, but I'm just wondering, there's probably another set of data here we need to think about, that's all. I have a feeling that the way that three, the methodology three is set up, what you were just saying might actually end up leading us towards the more pointed follow up questions that would need to be asked in order to be planning those projects. Because a lot of times when we, we talk about how is it going to affect certain populations, we might not actually see it in terms of how a, a, a racial component, an age component, and an income component all go together, whereas this might actually allow us to ask the right questions in those plannings. I think all right, I think, so good data all around, but but yeah, there's there's more to more to come. So yeah, I, I just yeah collect it and then figure out how it applies. Roger that. I think also this would be helpful in planning and thinking about things like uh, mass transit, you know, uh, Fred and things like that. Um, and and again, there is other data, and I know that at one point, and I don't know how far along we are in that, that Spotsylvania was looking to get more uh, data uh, or an updated rating of, of usage for Fred in, in the county. So. Yeah, it would be a combination of things. All right, well, we're this is the start of this uh, development of the methodologies, and so there'll be a lot more discussion of it, uh, PC and the, and the TAC. So um, is there any other thoughts for, for Jordan? Okay, then uh, I'd like us to move to item seven, Charlie, the, the long range transportation plan update from Adam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening to the committee members. Um, by way of reminder, we talked last month um, about a high level work plan that our team had put together, and we also kicked off um, the process to get membership for the LRTP working group. So we do have four members of the CTAC that will be part of that. And as a reminder to those folks, our first working group meeting is on Friday at 10 a.m. this week. Um, since last month, one of our primary efforts has been to develop uh, some recommendations along the goals and objectives for the plan. So um, in theory, right, and hopefully in practice, the goals and objectives should help inform all of the planning that takes place, both from a um, from an analysis standpoint, but then also from a project development standpoint as we um, 
start to put together the process to come up with the universe of projects that will be slated to receive federal funding between 2020 and 2050. So the goals and objectives we think aren't just something you should check the box on, but they're very important and should help inform and guide the whole rest of the planning document. So um, what I'd like to do is, um, so Stacy, if you could go maybe to the next slide here, um, talk a little bit about the background of um, sort of what we're doing. So, sorry, Stacy, one slide up above that. Um, so what the goals and objectives should reflect is the federal planning factors that are spelled out in MAP 21. Um, and I did realize after uh, finalizing this presentation, this is missing the final two planning factors. So there's actually two that should be on here. Um, that will be in our policy committee uh, packet that's going to be coming out tomorrow. But um, so anyway, the, the goals and objectives for the LRTP um, should reflect these federal planning factors. And so part of what we're looking to do and, and why we have this before the committee tonight is seeing if there are opportunities to improve these, whether there's language that's um, that's vague, perhaps, or could be updated based on new trends, new technologies, that sort of thing. But then also, if there's any type of uh, a more regional focus specific to the Fredericksburg region, um, where we should update some of this language. And so, Stacy, if you'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's kind of a quick list of the five goals um, that we have in the 2045 plan. Um, I, I will point out, um, it's worth noting that the 2045 LRTP was adopted as recently as summer 2018. So it's not like it's from the Stone Ages, it's relatively recent. And so um, at that point, this would have gone through a, an, an update, but not a substantial overhaul by any means. Um, I, and then what I'll do here too, I'm, so I'm not gonna read through each of the goals, but I'll ask Stacy to kind of slowly scroll through the next handful of slides where the goals are listed at the top and then the objectives underneath are, are listed below. And so, Stacy, if you'll kind of take your time scrolling through here and give folks who haven't maybe seen this in the packet ahead of time, just a, a quick chance to um, get a quick briefing here. And then we'll talk about some discussion items uh, at the end here. Thanks, Stacey. If you'll go ahead and scroll to the opportunities page. Yeah, here we go. So what we're looking to do tonight is somewhat twofold. So one is um, we're looking for committee feedback on if there's any deficiencies in the goals and objectives. So if there's anything sort of glaring that, hey, why is this not in here? Um, or if any language, like I said, is outdated, vague, confusing, that type of thing. Um, as well as new opportunities that um, where we should add language uh, to the goals and objectives to sort of round them out in a way. And so the other thing that we're trying to do, so Stacy has been working on a uh, survey that we're developing to distribute to the community um, at some point later this month. So that'll go out uh, the last week of October. So what we're trying to do to help inform the questions on that survey that goes out to the community is get committee feedback and suggestions. And so I, I will also add that since the TAC meeting where we presented this last week, um, we have received some edits from the city as well as Stafford planners. And so part of what we're looking to do tonight, again, is from a citizen's perspective, get um, further input to, again, help inform our, our survey. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it back over for a discussion to the committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? I, okay, I have one. Would it be helpful in this survey before it goes out for the committee to look at the survey and see if we got some feedback for the development of the committee, uh, for the feedback, for the, excuse me, for feedback on the survey itself before it's actually published? Would that be helpful to you? I mean, it would not be quick turn, I understand. But Adam or Stacey? 
I'll, I'll let Stacy take that one since the survey is in her wheelhouse. Yes, definitely. So your input tonight or, you know, in, in the next week, um, if you could send it to me, your thoughts on the survey will help me develop it. And then once it's developed, we can send out to all committee members for some final feedback. Um, our goal is that sometime in November, the survey will be released. But yes, definitely, it, it will be helpful to have uh, feedback on the draft survey itself. And we'll send that around. I will note that at the TAC meeting, we already had some uh, some quick suggestions or discussion uh, by Eric Nelson had some inputs and uh, um, also Paul Agnello had some inputs too. So it's already got some feedback. Right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, Stacy, when you said that, you would, uh, that, that this feedback, you want this feedback back to you? um so we are still working on developing the draft survey um, when i send you the email with the draft survey link you can click on the link and run through the survey as if it was the real thing and then okay. provide your feedback within a couple of days of receiving that i'll give you a, a hard deadline in the email okay all right thank that's you fair. that's fair Good. All right. And then, Stacy, can I ask you to scroll to the last page there? There's one more page. So just for everyone's awareness, just wanted to touch on a couple, um, a, a couple other topics that we're working on with the LRTP. So there's a few things that we're digging into as far as research. Um, so again, looking at the sort of long-term impacts of COVID-19 and starting to think about how that's going to affect our planning for the next 30 years. Um, also, uh, starting to look at changes in um, transportation funding. So, of course, you know, revenues are, are down substantially this last fiscal year and um, likely for this fiscal year. And so starting to think about how that's going to play out over time. And then, of course, the statewide plan, they're still in the process of putting together their midterm needs. So we're continuing to monitor that. Um, I, I will point out as well for the call for projects, that is uh, wholly separate from the uh, last couple policy committee meetings related to a call for projects for CMAC and STBG funding. This is for the LRTP. So this is taking sort of the universe of 2045 projects as well as anything new, um, getting those together, starting to evaluate those projects um, so that they can uh, be added to the project lists for 2045, or sorry, for 2050 um, this time around. So I wanted to point those two things out as well. So um, if there is any feedback, of course, on the goals and objectives, um, it's a lot of information, a lot of content all at once right now. I realize that. Um, please do let us know. Send an email to Stacy again, to uh, help inform the survey as we develop it. And with that, Mr. Chair, if I could, I'd like to turn it over to Matthew Lahane, who has a quick presentation on COVID-19 um and the data for our region and for the state yep thank you um so i'm just going to go through kind of uh what what we're terming a, a covid 19 data snapshot so just kind of understanding some of the statewide as well as the local trends in turn in terms of some of our transportation services um so first here we have um, some of our virginia commuter trends um so these are from the virginia community survey from july um, and what this is showing is some of the uh, trends beforehand, how people got to work, so their modes of travel, so how many people worked from home, how many people drove alone, how many people commuted using light rail, bus, metro, um, walking, carpooling, so, uh, and so on, and then as well as the typical commuting modes at the time of the survey, so in July. So, so kind of, uh, so we see that um, we have big differences, kind of work from home as well as drove alone in the whole state, so beforehand, approximately 12% uh, people worked from home. Now that's upwards of uh, over 50% of individuals are working from home, as well as a um, almost 50% decrease in people who are, are driving alone to work, as well as um, decreases in uh, commuter services as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
Um, and then this is showing, uh, again, the commuting trends to just the commute time changes. So you see the changes in the commute times between one minute to, to two hours, more than two hours. And now most people are working from home, so they, they don't have a commute. Next slide. Um, and then here we see from the same survey, um, but just the Fredericksburg uh, area. So this is the Fredericksburg area of VDOT district. Um, so including kind of the northern neck as well as the Fredericksburg region. Um, so we see basically the same trends. Um, 10, 15 percent of people were working from home beforehand. Most people were driving. And now most people are working from home, as well as we see increases in such a, uh, items such as commuter rail, carpooling, slugging, uh, and van pooling. Uh, next slide. Um, and then again, uh, the same sort of thing. We see decreases in, in how people are commuting. Uh, less people are uh, commuting that 1.5 to 2 hours, uh, 45, 60 minutes, and more people are now working from home. Um, and it, it is important to note that there still are people who are commuting. There are people who are still using the commuter services, um, but, but there is a, a decrease that, that we can obviously see from the charts here. Uh, next slide. Um, and then now into some of the, the Virginia transportation actual data. Uh, next slide. Um, so volume trends. Um, so this slide here is from a VDOT presentation to CTB in September, um, just showing the, the basic volume changes on, on roads. So all the vehicles and trucks, uh, we see kind of the, uh, the, the drop in, in March, in, in early March, and then we see it kind of uh, it is hitting its lowest point, upwards of 64% uh, below average uh, in in early April, um, and then slowly coming back up to where we are now, um, around about 15% below average of what we would have seen uh, around last year. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is from the same uh, VDOT presentation of the CTB, um, just the, the total crashes um, um, for this year. So the less crashes, um, and then slowly uh, going back up. Next slide. Um, and then again, uh, another little interesting note, uh, changes in gas prices. Um, so we see a, a decrease in demand for, for gasoline. So we see a decrease in a lot of the gas prices um, dropping around to, to 1.7 in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and then kind of slowly going back up, but still, still below what they were at um, around this time last year. Next slide. Um, and then again, a little bit more specific instances of, of the changes in gas prices. Um, so this is from late September. Um, so you see the, the Virginia averages as well as the, the Fredericksburg, this is uh, the city of Fredericksburg averages. Um, so we see the decreases uh, from where it was currently at uh, versus where it was at a, a year ago um, and versus a month ago, a week ago, and, and so on. Next slide. Uh, and now we will get into some of the Fredericksburg area changes. Um, so detailing um, the FAMPA area, so Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Stafford counties. Um, so this is from one of the platforms we have available to use that some of you have heard of before. We've talked about it before, so Streetlight. Um, so the Streetlight data platform provides um, some uh, vehicle miles traveled data uh, that we asked for. Um, so just City of Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Stafford, the total vehicle volume uh, per day uh, with the black line showing the seven-day moving average. So we see that it is, it is slightly uh, below normal from where it was last year. Or from where it was, sorry, from where it was earlier this year, I should say. I think that's important. What the trend last year really should be overlaid over there because there would be a, a valley and, and a peak. Exactly. Yeah, that that data unfortunately was not available uh, okay. for us. So yeah. Um, and then again from the VDOT CTP presentation, uh, so changes on I-95 vehicle traffic, uh, we see as described earlier the changes in in March and April, uh, and then the so increase. Uh, versus uh, this was the, the historic volume on I-95. So we see it slightly below average uh, for this portion of I-95, uh, Route 3, and the Stafford County line. Um, then a little bit more into some of our, our transit uh, services here in the region. So, so GW Ride Connect and some of the commuter services that they work with. Uh, so changes in lease parking space utilization at some of the, the lots. Uh, we see the decrease in the utilization here. Uh, it, and that people are still using it, people are commuting, uh, though there is less uh, that we see versus the 2019 and 2020 average. Next slide. 
Uh, and again, new van pools formed uh, slightly below um, last year's average as well. Next slide. Uh, as well as new commuter applications uh, below last year last year's average, but people are still commuting. Uh, we're still there are still applications being received every month for for new commuters to to use the van pools. Next slide. Uh, and then VRE, so commuter rail, uh, we see the decrease in ridership here, um, dropping to its lowest point in April, and then uh, slowly increasing from there as commuters are slowly getting back onto uh, using the VRE. I, Next slide. I was, uh, it struck me on that one is not, uh, I mean, obviously it's down because there are more people who are not commuting, period, not because they're working from home or they're only commuting right. one day a week instead of five days a week, whatever. But in addition, because the traffic is not so burdensome and troublesome, there are more people who are now choosing, a larger proportion of those who are commuting are using drive by themselves instead of the VRE and the buses and the yep. slugging and everything else. Right, yeah, that is correct. Um, and then Fred Transit, so a little more localized to travel within the region. Um, transit ridership has declined, as you can see here, through April, um, and then slowly, like VRE and, and Commuter services have slowly uh, gone back up into, into August. Uh, next slide. And just to kind of summarize some of the trends in the Fredericksburg area. So vehicle volume is about 15% less and commuter volume along services like the commuter rail uh, is about 80 to 90% less than their 2019 averages. So vehicle volume has almost returned to normal, uh, but transit slash commuter services are rebounding, albeit at a much slower rate. Um, so we are seeing people still using the roads. We're seeing people such as was mentioned, switching to driving alone versus using commuter services. Um, and and there it is rebounding, albeit, uh, as I said, a, a slower rate. Um, and then residents essentially are commuting less for work, but are still traveling in the region. So based off of the data shown here, as well as the survey responses. So most residents are continuing to work from home and those that are not are uh, a good number of them are driving alone rather than using some of the commuter services available. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions, inputs? All right, pretty, pretty straightforward. And I think something that we kind of expect, yeah, that all checks with, with what uh, we're experiencing or, or what we're observing, so yeah. Right. But thank you. Thank you. Stacy, you're going to cover uh, working group update? Yeah, sure. So Adam had mentioned when he was talking about how we're starting to develop the long range transportation plan. Um, and for just to refresh your memory, the long range tra transportation plan it's a very lengthy document that establishes the goals and the objectives for transportation in Spotsy, Stafford, and the city of Fredericksburg. The rural localities have their own plan, which um, I think uh, Adam will talk about here after I'm done. Um, but the long range transportation plan is a very long process to develop that. We're talking like a year plus. Um, so we're at the very early stages of that. And right now, um, members of CTEC who are a part of the working group that will meet in October, November, and December for one time uh, each of those months include Dave McLaughlin, Larry Gross, Matthew Rowe, and Wade Sudra. Um, however, all CTAC members, I just want to reassure you, will be definitely part of the process of developing the LRTP, um, that's the Long Range Transportation Plan, whether that includes helping with public outreach or providing feedback or uh, just receiving updates through meetings, whatever you have time for. So rest assured, if you didn't become part of that group, you're not excluded. You're gonna, by the end of next year, be sick of hearing about the long range transportation plan. Um, I guarantee it. So very early stages with that. Um, the next one is early public involvement for the long range transportation plan. So we have many things planned uh, to help the public really weigh in and participate in developing this document. After all, it, it's the transportation 
uh, system that's supposed to serve them. So we really need their input. Um, a few things that we have is we're going to have an initial survey, which is what we had just talked about a little while ago. Um, and I will send that to you guys sometime next week, just the draft. We need to let the policy committee provide um, primary feedback, which that will occur on Monday. So sometime mid next week, late next week, I'll send you the draft survey. And that's going to be asking the public to weigh in on what the goals and objectives for the plan should be. Um, we're going to later, after we actually have the lengthy draft document written, then we're going to go back to the public with another survey and ask them questions geared towards providing feedback on the entire plan. That's not going to happen until sometime next year. Um, on top of the surveys for the public involvement effort for this, we also are going to be doing virtual open houses and um, virtual public meetings as we're doing now. Um, so you guys will be aware of those, invited to participate. Um, we're also going to have a spot on our website that's dedicated just to information on the long range plan and how people can participate. So that'll be a great resource to you guys. Um, we also are looking at events or opportunities to get out into the public and do some in-person, but in a safe way, outreach. Um, haven't yet identified any of those things, but if we do have those, we had great response when we did the public library events with CTAC members participating. So I'll be sure to reach out and see if there's interest in attending those. As of right now, though, because of uh, health concerns, we don't have anything scheduled for in-person. Um, but we'll definitely be keeping CTAC members in the loop. So please, whenever we send you emails, just kind of look carefully for any opportunities that you can be engaged in this process. Um, I think that's all that I have for that one. So I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman, unless there's um, comments or questions. Any questions for Stacy? Okay, uh, the long range, rural long range plan update, Adam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a very brief update here tonight. So it's been a couple months, I think, since we had this before this committee. Um, we essentially got together um, a, a sort of finalized draft in the May, early June timeframe. Um, we've made a couple tweaks to it since that point, just sort of round out a couple things that we wanted to um, get in a better place before taking this to the GWRC board for their approval. So I'll ask Stacy to jump to the next slide here. So I think some of this information you have seen before. So just as a quick recap, um, part of why we're doing this, this is the first iteration of the Rural Long Range Transportation Plan. So this used to be part of the FAMPO LRTP. Um, and then from a federal certification review of the TPB, which included FAMPO in, I believe, 2018, maybe early 2019, um, one of the recommendations was for FAMPO to split out the urban LRTP just to the FAMPO area and then have a rural LRTP for the rural localities still within the PDC, so still within the GWRC region. So that, of course, is King George County and Caroline County. So just want to talk a little bit about sort of the impetus for um, why we're doing this now and, and why this is the first um, iteration. So as far as the topics covered, Stacy, on the next slide, these should look pretty familiar if you've taken a look at our FAMPO LRTP. It's the same general um, themes and topics and, and whatnot, um, but localized just to the rural localities. Um, so I won't read through these. You can see them here on the on the slide, but covers everything related to transportation um, in the in the two counties. Next slide, Stacey. Um, part of why we wanted to bring this before the committee tonight, um, Stacey will talk a little bit more in detail here in just a minute, but we want to have some level of public involvement and public engagement with this effort. So um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that with FAMPO, we have lots of requirements for public involvement. Um, we don't necessarily have the same requirements for what we do when we have our rural hats on and we're sort of working on um, efforts like this with the GBRC. And so we wanted to um, sort of make sure that we were doing more than checking the box and saying, this has been in a meeting packet. We wanted to make sure um, that folks had an ample chance to review this, not just at this committee, but but beyond as well. So 
I think with that, Stacey, let me go ahead and turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, sure. Um, so as Adam mentioned, so the rural long range plan um, is separate from our long range plan. Um, and because of that, it's considered a GWRC, a George Washington Regional Commission product. So we don't do a huge um, effort on public outreach for it, but we realize the importance of transportation in our rural localities and recognize that members, uh, or not members, um, commit, not committee members, community members rather, um, who live in those areas deserve the chance to weigh in on this plan. So we're asking for CTAC members help to spread the word um, that this plan exists, that the draft is going to be presented at the George Washington Regional Commission meeting this coming Monday, and that later in November, they plan on voting whether to adopt it or not. Um, so how, how can we assist you with spreading this message? Well, tomorrow we are going to be sending you an email and that email will contain some graphics that you can use on social media. It'll also include um, a flyer that you can print off. It'll also include suggested language so you can use to develop your own email or social media post um, or just talking points. And we just ask you in whatever way you're comfortable with to, to share this information um, with rural neighbors, um, let them know that they're welcome to attend the George Washington Regional Commission meeting and give public comments. They're also welcome to submit uh, written comments on the plan um, and just help us get them familiar that this plan exists and, and we, we welcome, well, George Washington Regional Commission welcomes their feedback. Um, so look for uh, that email coming to you uh, tomorrow. And I just want to also put a little plug in there that our graphics were designed by one of our interns, Maggie, and she did a really great job on this. Wanted to make sure I gave her credit for those. And that's all, Mr. Chair. Stacey, I have a question. Is that is that the email going to say uh, the planning communities in the in like Caroline County and and uh, or to uh, even the the elected officials so they would have that information available to them? Is there anything? Yeah, the information will be shared with them as well. Um, I'll say because our funding is constrained to the FAMPO regions, um, that's what kind of limits us for our efforts. But yes, we'll definitely be sharing the information and, and making them aware that they can share the news as well. Okay. Yep. Any other questions from anyone? All right. So um, we now have a new item that we, uh, when we change the agenda, we're going to talk about the. Uh, uh, regional study ideas and proposals. So this again will be another opportunity for CTAC to uh, provide inputs uh, from our perspective. So Adam, if you want to, please. Sure, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chair. And I'll, I'll sort of touch briefly on kind of the, the, the conversation at the TAC and then follow your lead for how you want to guide the discussion here with the CTAC members. Um, so we did talk about on October 5th at the TAC meeting, um, we basically wanted to make the offer to kind of um, be the uh, coordinator of developing a list of proposed um, studies within the region. So for those of you that have been around for some time now, you know that the primary way that we put forward projects in smart scale and other funding programs for consideration of funding is to first study those areas, get the, the, the data, the metrics on um, what specifically needs to be improved. Those studies will develop a set of recommendations, and then that typically is what becomes our projects that we put forward for funding. Um, so it's a, it's a very important uh, thing that we do and sort of help coordinate as the regional player um, as, as FAMPO. So uh, again, what we did at the TAC, we just sort of made that offer to uh, start collecting ideas from staff members um, as far as areas in their localities or um, you know, just within the region as a whole, as far as any ideas or proposals for a study. So um, I think, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for uh, how you might want to go about that here tonight. Well, uh, my purpose for putting on the agenda was two, twofold, to make the, me the members of this committee aware that it is, that, you know, their counterparts at the TAC 
uh, I've been offered this uh, opportunity to come up with these suggestions and ideas and proposals, and also to uh, to tell us, the members of the committee, that we are allowed to do that as well. So is there something that you think is, has been understudied uh, or with the uh, developments? An example that came up, which is a really good one, was with Spotsylvania getting a new VA hospital, do we need to study that area, for example? So you might know something in your commit in your community that uh, you know ought to be uh, considered for possible a uh, study. So anyway, I'm we'll just open up for you. It's more homework for you guys to for an opportunity to make inputs. Any questions? Okay, uh, we'll move on to um, the next item is the proposed language for the bylaws. Stacy. Yep. Okay. Let me just pull up. Okay. So the text that you see in blue is the language we are proposing. Um, why are we proposing that this language be adopted into the CTAC bylaws? Well, um, we are required to adopt a policy on remote meeting participation. Um, and it must be in accordance with Virginia FOIA public meeting laws. Um, the language that's being proposed for inclusion into the CTAC bylaws was developed by staff. Um, staff used suggested language from the Virginia Freedom of Information um, Council, as well as um, applicable Virginia laws. Um, and this item is being brought up for discussion only tonight, of course, you know, if you do wish to act upon it, um, you have that liberty to do so, but we were just proposing this as a discussion item. Um, and if there's any questions about this language and how we developed it, I'm happy to send members um, the references and the legal citations of uh, what we use in order to, to develop this language for you. Timing wise, um, we are currently, if you look at um, section, six down here um, we are currently operating um, in a virtual quorum for this committee under provisions that allow us to do so in a state of emergency um, so we do not need this language adopted right now in order to continue meeting um, we will need it adopted before the state of emergency ends um, so you can see timing wise it's not like you know Next month, you have to have it adopted, but we want it adopted, you know, um, as soon as possible, just so we're covered when when the state of emergency is lifted. Then everyone will be able to attend these meetings uh, remotely. So if you have any questions about the language in there, I'm happy to um, answer any questions on it. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, Stacey, it's not, it's not, uh, I, I, I'm questioning. I just have interested in the language. I've never seen it, but I, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm not fairly new, but I am new. I just want, I just want to get the language. If you could text, uh, 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 send that to me. It's not that I'm questioning it. I just want to learn the language. That's it. Yep. Yep. That's it. That's definitely fine. I'll go ahead then and send our resources that we use to develop this around to all the committees. Um, you will note that the resources have highlights. Um, I've went and highlighted those areas that um, kind of answer the most frequently asked questions of what we're proposing. So don't necessarily only read what's highlighted. Go ahead and you know take a read through if you're interested. Um, so just want to make sure you know it's not only the highlighted portions in these resources that are important to review but I will send those to you tomorrow. I'm sorry, say I stepped down for a minute when right at the beginning, you might've said this, but this is essentially the same process as the TAC and the PC are going through and the same, the verbiage is pretty much the same. Is that correct? Um, the bike ped and the TAC, yes, it's the exact same language. Um, they are not working on this currently for the policy committee. Um, I believe Adam can correct me. I believe they might take this up maybe in November. I think they're still working through wanting to incorporate additional bylaw changes in addition to just on remote participation 
and right now they're kind of held up doing that. We have to amend the um, yearly work plan, the UPWP, um, before they can make substantial changes. So that's kind of on hold for them right now, but CTAC is fine, any committee um, in FAMPO is fine to adopt this remote um, language in particular. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Mr. Chair, may I speak? It's Leah yes. B. Hill. Um, I was just going to say this is something that just is related in terms of bylaw updates. Um, we haven't we haven't discussed this specifically, but since it's kind of under discussion um, for your consideration, I just noticed that CTAC does not have a line item in terms of how the meetings are conducted. And so I did just want to suggest that maybe you kind of follow tax bylaws and have in there something along the lines they have um, that it shall operate through consensus, but otherwise use Robert's rules of order to ensure an orderly meeting. Just so there's some consistency and a little bit more clarity in terms of how the meetings are run. Okay, up, up the top of your head, do you know what section that is? Maybe well, I have, yeah, I have the TAC meetings out here for me, but I, we can also um, reference that in the email that Stacy sends out. But yes, it's for the TAC bylaws, it's under Article 6, um, Section 5, and it's conduct of meetings. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. <laughs> Any others on this subject? Well, then, Leah, you have the floor again, I guess. Yes, thank you. Um, for the calendar update, let me pull that calendar up. As uh, CTAC members know, you regularly meet the second Wednesday of the month, but if you will look specifically at November coming up, um, that Wednesday, the second Wednesday is Veterans Day, so you chose to move it to the Tuesday before, November 10th. Um, I will also draw your attention to the Monday before, which is um, the 9th, and TAC moved their meeting from the week prior to that uh, due to national elections. Um, also in October this month, you might want to be on the lookout for the possibility of an additional TAC meeting, as well as an additional policy committee meeting, depending on action taken at the Monday meeting. And those additional meetings will not come out on this calendar, but they will be on our homepage as well as the committee web pages. Um, this calendar is on the homepage for printout as well as on this agenda. So you have it for reference just for the regularly scheduled meetings. But again, all of the additional or special meetings will be separately um, advertised. That is all, thank you. Thank you, and, the, and you're right, we made the change in November uh, at the last meeting, so thank you. For yes, so the next meeting will be uh, Tuesday, the 10th at 6 p.m. Right. Okay, um, we've got the uh, final public comment, Stacey. As you said, uh, we might have some members of the public who are welcome to one last chance to uh, make a comment. Is there anyone out there from the public who would like to make a comment? Okay, I, I, I would expect there might be a, when you have a long meeting like this. But uh, anyway, the uh, we do if there is anybody who's here and is not making a comment is online or listening, and we do uh, allow you to make the survey, and it's shown here on the page uh, to make inputs with this survey to how the meeting was conducted, what kind of information you're getting, any kind of feedback you want to give us. We would appreciate that to make us do our job better. Okay, correspondence. Please. Okay, so we have, um, where to go? There we go. Um, what you're looking at on your screen is a letter of resignation from one of our CTAC members who represented King George County, um, Leslie Jordan. She has resigned. The other correspondence we have for you. Um, is a link to the Virginia Commuter Survey. Um, 
this will give you a, a overview of round one of their survey results. Um, and it was looking at how commuter behavior has changed since COVID-19 began. And um, Matthew had gone into some of the statistics, but if you're interested in, in reading more, go ahead and take a look at their um, round one results. Round two survey was just released. We have a link to that on our website. And again, this is a VDOT survey, not a FAMPO survey. Um, not on our website, I'm sorry, on our social media pages, we have posts um, that will give you links so that you can share the survey, take the survey yourself. And that's all that we have for correspondence. Staff reports? Um, so exciting news, maybe, fingers crossed. Um, we anticipate a new FAMPO administrator will be hired shortly. Um, I have no idea who it may or may not be, um, but we've heard word that, you know, the interviews have, have gone well and that perhaps we can expect to have one um, in the next coming weeks. Um, also, other things to report, FAMPO is in the process of completing a Title VI audit with VDOT. Um, Title VI refers to Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, it deals with um, preventing discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. However, um, in the transportation industry, Title VI is used more broadly to describe preventing discrimination not only on race, color, national origin, but also on income status, limited English proficiency, um, uh, disabilities, um, things like of those nature. So VDOT just routinely looks at metropolitan planning organizations, um, sees what they're doing to proactively reach out to vulnerable members of our community. Um, so we're going through that process right now and you should have received a survey last week. Um, we need all FAMPO committee members and alternate members to take that survey. Um, it We've gotten a lot of questions about it because it only asks one question. It asks you to identify your race and your choices are um, tightly constrained to census race categories. Now, the reason it's asking only for your race is because that's the only question at this time VDOT is asking us to answer. It's not because FAMPO only thinks that one question on race you know, is all that matters to determine whether we're being inclusive or not. So please uh, do not get that false impression. If you recall over the summer, we had sent committee members um, a diversity and demographic survey. And that survey really provided us uh, staff internally with a lot of information on uh, what our committees look like and, and gave us um, some talking points that we could um, have conversations of how we can improve diversity within the committees and staff. Um, so definitely that question, don't be alarmed. It's very, very narrowly targeted for a reason. And let me see. Oh, um, we also received another CTAC resignation. We don't have the letter for you today in your packet. Um, Timothy Haddix of uh, Stafford County also has decided to resign from CTAC. And that's all for staff reports. And we also got a couple of uh, people uh, re-established or their their membership uh, extended, I should say, through their uh, through their uh, council and or um, through the the uh, this county. Um, so one thing on the you mentioned a possible administrator in a week. You probably meant maybe announced in a week, not on board in a week, I would think. Is that true, Stacey? You, did, you, you didn't imply, you yes. were trying to here in a week, yeah, okay. Didn't yeah, imply. yeah, I, I'm guessing announced in, a, in the next few weeks. Um, Adam can step in if he knows any other top okay. secret information, but. <laughs> the way you said that's it. That's my hopeful like, guess. We'll be on board in a week, so anyway. Um, and then on the, um, uh, let's see, the, um, I had another thought, and I should have written it down. Um, yeah, I'll pass. Maybe it'll come to me. So let's go to member reports. Any of the members from uh, Fredericksburg want to report anything? 
I have nothing in particular to report. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't pipe up, then we'll we'll assume that you're not. So, uh, anybody, uh, Stafford. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. I have nothing. Thanks, David. Well, uh, Goldsmith here. Nothing to report at this time. Oh, wait, Sudworth. Nothing to report. Sudworth here. Uh, nothing to report. Uh, any of the at large? Yeah. This is Larry Gross. I just, uh, the only thing I'd say is that when we're talking about the coronavirus effect on transportation and we're talking about commuting and things, uh, one of the, one of the, th the big impacts to traffic in the, in the immediate area, in the FAMPO area, is whether or not the schools are in session, whether they're in person or not. There's a lot of traffic that gets generated by the schools during the day. So I don't know how to, Fold that into what we're doing, but I, I think it's if you can have a significant impact on traffic in the Fredericksburg area itself when schools are fully in session. Hey, uh, King George. Yeah, I just want to make a uh, comment. Uh, B dot's been very active on the turn lanes on 301 into the B gate at Dahlgren. And it's really caused a lot of mess of traffic. Last Friday, southbound traffic on Friday for the holiday weekend, it was backed up across the bridge into Maryland. And I know a couple of our supervisors have reached out to VDOT about that, but I don't know what their schedule is for finishing it, but it's a ways away still. But it's a, and I just hope that's not a, uh, sign of what's coming with some of the other major changes to 301 down the road. Okay. Um, hopefully that'll, yeah, let's see. Uh, Caroline. What have I forgot? Anybody? Anybody else? I forgot? Hey, Dave, it's Neil at Spotsy. I didn't hear you say Spotsy, but I mean, I'll go real quick. Um, the only thing I had, uh, this, this is Stacy, the, the resignation letter with Haddix is in the second sheet of the one underneath Miss Jordan, but I don't know if you're waiting for something a little more formal. Uh, I don't have anything real significant to support, uh, for Spotsy, but, um, I would say, um, with regards to the, um, rural long range plan, I didn't see it. Is it on the CTAC, not the CTAC, but the FAMPO website anywhere to look up, or is it just linked inside the agenda? Uh, um, you're looking for information on the um, rural plan on FAMPO website. Yeah, I see the I see the long range transportation one. Is it embedded in there? So we don't have information. Right, it'll be its own separate page for this new effort. Um, but if you look under okay. plans, long range plan at this top here, um, click on that. Um, and so this is general information on the long range plan. And then we have our information on the most current one, the 2045. Um, there's a story map, which is being slow to load. So none of this has been created yet since we're still in the early stages for the 2050, our, our update effort. Um, but there will be a link on this page that will take you to another page, which is specific to the process of developing the, the 2050. And we'll have all the information there so yes when when you're looking for information go to plan the long range plan and then we'll have a link s somewhere probably replacing this um or above this that says click here to see the most recent information on the developing 2050 long range hey. plan hey stacy right, so there's, no, there's no there's no existing rural plan right now either oh, the it'll be part of the next rural year. plan the role plan. Adam, do you want to take that? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, so Neil, that's not in the packet for the CTAC meeting tonight. When Stacy sends out the graphics and everything, the information for you guys tomorrow in that email, she'll attach the rural LRTP draft to that email so, so that you guys have it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear you say rural. I thought you were just saying the long range plan. Yeah, no, no, that's no problem. And uh, the only other thing I had was uh, appreciate you and uh, I think it was Nadira Green helping me get re, um, you know, up as part of a member. Uh, thanks a lot for that. So um, here's to another two years. Over. I'm out. Great. And, and Neil, I did say Spotsy. Let the record reflect. <laughs> yeah, I would miss you guys. All right, uh, so that's everything. So I think it was a, a very, we had a lot to talk about. There's a lot of opportunities for us to make input on an individual basis. Um, so we got to follow up on that. So well, I will uh, adjourn the meeting at this time. Thank you all very much. We second.